Hello, scrappers, recyclers, and investors. Welcome to Shark Scrapper Live, where we talk about all kinds of stuff that influences our world of scrapping, recycling, and the businesses associated with scrapping and recycling. Welcome to our live stream. I hope you are having a great day. I also hope that you can hear and see me okay. So if y'all want to just drop a quick note and let me let me know for sure that you can hear me and that we're all good to go there. We will continue on. It has been a fantastic week. I hope everybody enjoyed our uh, interview with Chris from boardsort.com last week. Um, I had a blast uh, interviewing him, learned a lot. Uh, so uh, uh, let me know if there's any other folks that you would like me to see if I can get in here for an interview. Um, and just in case you're curious, I have reached out to Ben. Um, so um, I have had a couple of people who have already suggested that I try to get eways Ben up here for uh, for a, a live stream. Um, and Ben's thinking about it, but you know, it's pretty early in Australia right now, and he likes his privacy. So it's a pretty tall order. So I wouldn't get too excited thinking that we're ever going to get e-waste Ben to join us, but we'll keep working on it and we'll see. Maybe someday he'll just feel like having some fun and come on up. All right. I'm glad you can hear me okay. Uh, welcome, Scrapping Irish, Gaz Gaz, Deanna, J.R. Cat. Um, that's Deanna Luttrell, by the way. Salad Cream Boy. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Great to see you here. Silver Scorpion, Gulf Coast. Great to see everybody here. Uh, I am really excited. And yes, this is Hippie Shark. Man, I tell you what, I have not had this much hair in all my life. Um, Mrs. Shark is, you know, kind of liking having some hair back here. And so I'm letting it grow out a little bit. Uh, I don't know. It's going to take some getting used to because uh, um, it's uh, it's different. I mean, I'm used to having high and tight and and, you know, nothing there at all, right? You know, it used to be I could take, rub the soap on my hand, rub my hand over my head, and my hair was done, right? <laughs> all right, so today we have a couple of interesting things that we're going to be looking at. Uh, one of the first things in our precious metal and industrial metal world that we're going to talk about, we're actually going to compare uh, a precious metal and an industrial metal. And how they are related and how the influence of the automobile industry, EVs versus standard vehicles is going. So um, we're going to be, I like to call this the uh, cats versus bats. Um, and what I mean by that is we're going to be talking platinum, which is used in catalytic converters and nickel, which is used in batteries. So cats versus bats. Uh, that should be a pretty interesting look at the charts and some talking about what's going on uh, in the world there. Uh, and then we're going to talk for stocks today. We're talking uh, chemicals, better living through chemicals, not those kind of chemicals, okay? Um, but the chemical industry that, you know, isn't that, that we need to worry about from an industrial side. Uh, hey, Dane, uh, welcome. Great to see you here. Uh, oh, there's a new name. How do I pronounce that? Zatomi Emil? Welcome, Zatomi. Nice to have you here. Desert Scrapper, great to have you here. Wannabe Scrapper, great to have you here. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna comment on that one. <laughs> yeah, we're not gonna get, we're not gonna talk about that. Um, ponytail. No, I don't know, man. I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure about the ponytail. Um, maybe, and, and uh, definitely not man bun. Uh, Desert Scrapper, you haven't had hair that long since Woodstock days. Okay. All right. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't go to Woodstock. Yep, didn't go to Woodstock. Uh, so, by the way, just in case, I had this up last week. I don't know if anybody saw in the background my Mako Speed plaque. Uh, you, there, I did a mail call on this. Silver Scorpion and Gulf Coast. ACR got together and uh, dreamed this up for me. So it's back here. I'm not sure where it's going to end up uh, forever, but you can see that it's got this shark 
uh, jumping out of the water there. It's Mako speed. Uh, so that's very cool. I don't know if it's going to be staying here in the office or going to the shark cage. Uh, we'll find out. Um, probably mess around with moving it all over the place and, you know, see see where what ends up as, uh, as a good place for it. All right. So without any further ado, let's get right into cats versus bats. Now we are going to get over here to the platinum spot price. Uh, we can see here one week spot price platinum is down uh, 2.73%. So um, we, we, you know, it's like, uh, well, well, wait a minute here. We had this flat, you know, it kind of dropped off, right? We had, we had this, um, we sort of had this nice little uh, plateau going here and then, and then it just sort of dropped off here. So what was up with that? Well, let's take a little bit longer view here. Uh, let's go out three months and we can see we've got this kind of weird hump like thing going on here. Uh, so if we go out uh, for a year, uh, we can see here was that three month hump, but we had this big dip in September and we started climbing out of the dip. Um, start putting your thinking caps on. Think about what's going on in the automobile industry and the correlation to why we may have had a peak and then it dips off and then starts picking up. Now, let's go back and make sure that we can see everything relative to what happened with COVID, right? Uh, so, you know, it's funny. It's like we, whenever we talk about stuff now, we talk about pre-COVID, COVID, post-COVID. Post -COVID. It's like in our generation, um, you know, for our for those of us that have lived through this now, this is like a defining uh, time stamp in events. So you've got uh, 2019, you've got uh, you've got COVID going on here, and you know there's a drop in platinum, but uh, it's not as huge as we saw for a lot of things uh, that went on. Uh, and then it really craters here. I, you know, this is uh, what is that? That's May. Uh, March of 2020, it's like, you know, everything is stopped. And now we're going to start digging back out here. And you see platinum starting to come up again and come up again. People are getting out, buying cars, things are going on. And then it starts dropping off. Well, remember, as we were digging out of COVID, there was a chip shortage. And that was really holding back the automobile manufacturing. Uh, so, uh, you know, they can only get so high because they can only make so many cars, right? But I know you all are thinking this, so, you know, we're just going to chat through this. Um, there were also a lot of manufacturers that would make the car without all of the chips and computers and set it off in their lot, and then they would come back and put it all in there later on. So, um it's a, you know, it's sort of this interesting thing of they needed the catalytic converters when they were building up the cars, but the cars weren't being sold. How much impact was there really on the uh, catalytic converters? So, uh, but the bottom line for us now is that we see that the demand kind of dropped off here, slowly picked up again, um, and now it's dropping off once again. So, you know, it's like, what's going on with platinum? Um, as we discussed a couple weeks ago, platinum has more uses than just catalytic converters, but the industrial demand for platinum is one of the primary drivers and catalytic converters, of course, being a primary driver of what's going on uh, with platinum. So we, you know, we, if we look at this, this period here, as we look at this period here, we see you know, uh, platinum is relatively flat, you know, just it, it's it's ups and downs there, but it's relatively flat. And that uh, that we can see that clearly if we go year to date here. Oops, got to get the right button, dummy. We go year to date, uh, you know, down 12 percent, three month only down three uh, percent. So, yeah, platinum. Uh, I don't know. Does anybody invest in platinum? Do any of you buy platinum as an investment? You know, platinum rounds, platinum bars, um, 
I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I'm, I never, I never really wanted to uh, go down the world, that road of, um, uh, Hey, scrapping together, Bill, how's it going? Great to see you here, man. Um, uh, because I just, it, it was one of those things that I just couldn't wrap my head around using platinum as an investment uh, type thing, not like gold or silver, uh, gold or silver, pretty easy to go, go out and buy and sell. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I always shied away from platinum as an investment. Um, salad cream boy, you ask a very interesting question there. Um, at what point would you pinpoint post COVID? Um, you really, you know, that's, that is, I don't think you get it. You could draw a line on a, on some long-term chart and say, boom, this is post COVID. It's a time frame of when the world started opening up again and, and different countries opened up faster than others. Different industries came back online faster than others. So I don't know that you could really just draw some line uh, and on the on the you know on a chart and say this is post COVID. Um, but what I like to do when I'm looking at these long term charts is we look through 19 going into 20, 20 into 21, and we see this transition. All right, so the the operating theory that um, that a lot of folks would have is that as electric vehicles take over or gain more market share compared to internal combustion engine vehicles, we're going to see a decrease in demand in platinum. Uh, that is one of that that is a potential argument. However, what I find very interesting is that a lot of the people that do the long-term pro, pro, uh, prognosticating, try saying that word a few times, um, they still see platinum, the demand for platinum increasing. Uh, there are some places that are forecasting the price for an ounce of platinum in 2030 to be $2,500. And, you know, you can see right now we're at 964. So, that would suggest that platinum is not going to be going away anytime soon. Um, so our EV cars really going to have a serious impact on the future of platinum. Um, and I, I'm I'm be the first one to tell you that uh, you know when it comes to making those kind of long term forecasts, uh, I'm just I'm not there. It's not a game that I'm going to play. Uh, so um, I'm very curious though uh, who out here has thought about that and what position are you taking when it comes to uh, platinum? Uh, Desert Scrapper says he has a platinum chip. He got it from a video game collector edition. Oh, very cool. Um, very cool. Let's see. Uh, Man and Camera says it doesn't have enough leverage. Yep, I'm good with that. Um, I, I, uh, I have to agree with you on that. All right, so uh, let's see. Anybody else? Uh, I don't see anybody else here who has any plat has commented about whether or not they own um, platinum. But here's another good comment from Scrapping Irish: Platinum acts as an effective and durable catalyst in hydrogen-powered fuel cells. Very good, Irish man. That is an awesome comment because there are a lot of people who talk about one of, about the challenges of EV vehicles being um, unsustainable or uh, the demand that they place on other minerals, and we're going to talk about that here in just a minute, means that they're really not as environmentally uh, competitive as we would like to think or hope that they are. And those people the, that believe in that argument, they suggest that hydrogen-powered fuel cells and fuel cell cars are probably a good way to go. Um, so, hey, Everyday Sellers, great to see you here. Thank you. I'm glad you were able to join us. So uh, platinum still has a possibility if, uh, you know, has good, strong possibilities in the future if the hydrogen-powered fuel cell world continues to move forward. So, yeah, that, that was an awesome comment, Irish, um, and uh, really important to the discussion. Um, okay, so 
that's the cats. Now let's talk about the bats. Let's go over and talk uh, nickel. So here we have uh, nickel. Now um, we talked about nickel a couple weeks ago as well, just from the you know the background perspective of what nickel is and all the things that it's used in. But it's a uh, it's an important element in batteries. So I want to talk about uh, nickel now. Um, I found a graphic that showed the minerals that go into an EV. Uh, and this was sort of averaged out, you know, kind of thing uh, across current mo current state of the art electric vehicles. Uh, lithium, 8.9 kilograms. Nickel, 39.9 kilograms. Cobalt, 13.3 kilograms. Now, nickel and cobalt both being, you know, important battery minerals. Manganese, 24.5 kilograms. Uh, graphite, 66.3. Copper, 53.2 uh, kilograms. And other rare earths, about 0.5. Now, kind of interesting, you, copper is one that we can compare between a internal combustion engine car and an EV. And in an com, uh, internal combustion car, copper is about 22.3 kilograms. So um, you can see that the EVs are going to use up a lot more copper. And we've talked about copper. We'll continue to look at copper moving forward. But today we're talking nickel and 39.9 kilograms of nickel used, you know, in, a, in an EV. So there's a strong demand signal for nickel in the form, you know, as it plays in batteries. And of course, there's a whole lot of uh, battery technology out there besides just in electric vehicles, right? We've got we've got batteries that are being used for, for the power grid. We've got batteries that are being used in the, in smart homes. Um, a lot of people that when they put solar cells on their homes, they have a battery wall. So a lot of nickel being consumed, not just with EVs, but batteries in general. Uh, if we look at the, uh, the nickel spot price, and you know, I like to go look at long-term trends. So we're going to go down here to the five year nickel spot. And uh, what we can see is that overall, it had a pretty steady uh, climb. And um, we had this spike here. So that was roughly uh, April 2022. Uh, and, you know, we're, uh, we've got this, uh, a, a lot of things that are going on here about a year ago that would have driven a spike in the nickel price um, like, you know, wars. <laughs> so um, I try not to get too excited about these anomalous spikes because they will average out over the long haul. Um, and then if you look at um, the time frame that we kind of associate with uh, COVID in here, uh, we can see that, you know, nickel went down, then started coming back up. And then post COVID, we see this nice climb out, uh, a nice steady increase in the nickel demand signal. Now let's go down and look at the available inventory. So we go down to the London metal exchange warehouse levels. And in the five year London metal exchange, we see that the Inventories were being consumed. Oops. I keep hitting that button and making this great big thing, don't I? Got to stop doing that. All right. So we see that the warehouse levels, uh, you know, were consuming a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, they're consuming a lot of the inventory uh, as COVID is cooking along. We come out of COVID, but they're, they start producing uh, inventory again. The levels are stocking up. And we get the war going on, we get demand signals increasing, and so they start using up uh, the inventory levels again. So um, we're down at the low. So right, you can see here, we've got this, this floor, and we've gone through this floor, uh, this five-year floor for nickel inventory. Um, I am one of those folks, a supply-demand kind of folks, and so... Um, you know, to me, this says we should expect nickel prices to keep going up. All right. So here's a question for the scrappers out there. Well, I'm talking nickel. 
you know, where do we find nickel? Where are we finding nickel in the scrap that we're collecting and that we're trying to get recycled? So let's, you know, go ahead and put your, put your comments in there uh, so that we understand, um, you know, where nickel is coming from. Because recycling is one of those things that can help to offset the demand for mining of these materials. So it's important for us to understand, you know, where nickel is coming from. Uh, while we're doing that, I want to say hi to Simon the Celt Scrapper. Um, I'm kind of curious, Simon, do you actually, do you scrap wearing a kelt? Or maybe I just shouldn't, maybe I just shouldn't ask that question. Maybe I don't want to know the answer to that. Um, let's see, I thought I saw, oh, Cruiser Mac. Hey, Cruiser, great to see you in here, man. Hope you're doing well up north. So I'm still looking here. Uh, what was this? Simon says permaloy in oscillographs. Okay. Um, I don't even think I would recognize that if I saw it sitting on the street. <laughs> gotta be, uh, gotta be honest with you, man. I wouldn't know what that looked like. Um, Let's see, JR Cat, uh, Hasteloy and Inconel Turnings. Okay, yeah. So you know, if you um, if you've got um, if you've got some shops that you work with, that's a possibility. Um, and uh, see you scrapping said about twenty five years ago, he was working for a scrapyard that got helmet molds from Bell helmets that were nickel. Oh, interesting. All right. Very cool. Hey, Gibby, welcome. Uh, so Tim, grass cutter Tim, thank you, man. Great, great to see you here, bud. So let's see, where else are we getting nickel from? I thought I saw another comment here. Everyday Solars is uh, throwing out cutlery, uh, nickel-plated items. Okay, yep. Um, so, you know, the... Um, And of course, and coins, but of course we don't scrap coins. That yeah, that's yeah, true. We're not supposed to scrap coins. So um, good sources for nickel. Now, long-term demand for nickel, I, I you know, the prices are going to keep going up. Uh, we're, you know, we're we're gonna see that demand signal continue uh, to uh, rise. So we need to keep our eyes out for uh, things that might have nickel in them um, that we can, you know, be recycling and, and see what that market will come out to. And as we as we develop a better understanding of that, we can we can work with that one more. All right. So uh, that's my uh, take on uh, cats and bats. Um, the. Um, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to see how this all plays out. Um, you know, this uh, this interesting world that we live in as EVs become more of a thing and as the world uh, tests out other technologies for vehicles, um, we'll see what that does to uh, the world that we live in, where we're trying to scrap and recycle products and hopefully make some money off of it as well. All right, so uh, our safety tip for the day. This one might not be so obvious. Situational awareness. You know, we, especially as scrappers, we can frequently find ourselves in places that uh, can be a little dodgy. In a video that I put up this week as I was driving out of the scrapyard to go back out on the scale to get my outweight, I made a comment. Uh, hey, Bush Dog, great to see you, man. I made the comment about being careful when you're driving around the scrapyard. And that's what I mean by situational awareness. Um, just Let's just take that scenario of driving through the scrapyard. Um, you've got at a scrapyard, you're going to have... Um, some sort of industrial machinery. It might be forklifts, it might be the big cranes, it might be bigger trucks. Um, they're always gonna be driving around 
And um, a lot of times, no matter how hard the scrapyard tries to train their people on safety, those people are going to get fatigued. They're going to get careless. They're going to get just caught up in their day to day of what they have to uh, work on. So um, it's very important that you protect yourself as well by maintaining your situational awareness. Uh, when we were uh, aboard the, whenever we were out on the flight deck of a ship, we would always say you had to keep your head on a swivel. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I was in the Navy for 25 years. Uh, and so whether it was the flight deck of an aircraft carrier or a smaller ship, the helo deck, you always kept your head on a swivel because you never knew when there was something out there trying to kill you. And the, and the same is true, especially when you're at a scrapyard. But it's also important when you're making your pickups. When you are at someone's house or someone's business and you're picking the stuff up from there, you don't know that place. There could be hazards there that you need to pay attention to. So you want to always assess that environment before you dive into picking up the scrap um, and just to be a little bit careful. Um, a few months ago, I was doing a pickup uh, at a house. It had been vacant for quite some time. It had been purchased. They were going to make it a rental property and they wanted to get rid of a bunch of stuff that was on the property. So they asked me to pick up a trampoline, an old refrigerator, some metal that was laying around. And one of the things that I recognized right away when I pulled up was the shed that the refrigerator was in eh, was a little bit, you know, I was a little bit concerned about it. I, I actually went up and pushed on it really hard a few times. Uh, hey, Evie, how you doing? Welcome. Great to see you here. Just to make sure that the shed wasn't going to fall down on me while I was in there moving this big refrigerator around. Um, I also, well, this is Florida. So, you, so, you know, down here, uh, we have a lot of critters, uh, and it was the summertime. So I was also just, you know, took a quick look around to look for any large, um, wasp nests or ground wasp nests, kind of things that look like there might be critters in the area that would want to come out and, you know, get upset with me for making noise and disturbing their habitat. If you're picking up at an industrial location, uh, of course, you've got the same issues that you're going to have at a um, recycling center. So um, it is always important to keep your situational awareness um, top of mind. Um, if you're picking up uh, dumpsters, if they're construction site dumpsters, um, you know, you're going to have usually you're going to have uh, potholes and uneven soil that you have to watch out for. You're going to have uh, things in the dumpster that will try to cut you. Uh, so again, situational awareness, very important. Uh, I cannot say how many times I have not gotten hurt because I took the time to look around and see what was out there that could hurt me. Street Copper 11, great to see you here, man. Awesome. And you know what? Seeing Street Copper 11 show up reminds me of another example for situational awareness. Um, uh, he, as you know, is a welder. And so one of the things that, that I'm sure he goes through, whether he does it consciously or it's just something that he does automatically now, uh, is what is the risk of starting a fire uh, when he's working on welding or working on a piece of you know equipment? And if we are out there, uh, whether we're working with a heat source, like a, um, let's see, what is Irish's favorite tool? A heat gun? Uh, Irish, is that is that your favorite tool, a heat gun? Um, or you've got a torch going, um, or you're using acids. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that you're not going to start a fire, that you're not going to, you know, kill yourself with gas, those kind of things. So again, that's all goes into situational awareness. What are you going to be using? What tools, what hazards, and have you prepared your space accordingly? Okay. Stock time. Stock time. I tell you, I'm, I, I love doing these, these uh, stock company reviews because uh, they're, they're uh, to me, it's fascinating to look at this kind of stuff. 
Now, for those of you that are new to this live stream, um, here's what we do. Uh, you know, just a quick background on the way I approach um, stocks that I'm going to talk about. I get all of my information. Well, not all of it, but my primary source of information is the Value Line Investment Survey. Uh, this source does not take any advertising revenue. All the revenue is generated through the subscriptions that people like me pay to get the weekly newsletter. Therefore, all of the data is just straight data that has not been uh, biased. <laughs> all right, wait a minute. Let me get rid of this one. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, so uh, none of the data has been biased by the needs to, you know, satisfy uh, an advertiser. And um, they provide some, you know, pretty critical analysis of companies, good and bad. Uh, but what I really enjoy about their data is that it goes back 17 years. So... Uh, when I'm considering whether or not I'm going to invest in a company, I look back through 17 years of earnings per share, cash flow per share, and dividends per share. I am a very boring investor. I'm just in it for dividends. So I am primarily interested in if the company has provided increasing dividends per share for the last 17 years. And I know there's a lot of folks out there that think that's a hard or, you know, bar to pass. And it is, there aren't that many companies that can pass that bar, but there are some good companies out there that have literally increased their dividends every year for the last 17 years, dividends per share. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at two chemical companies. And, uh, you know, chemical companies are important for us, right? Um, they're, they, without the chemical companies, the industrial companies that are making the stuff that we are scrapping probably can't make the stuff that we're scrapping. These chemical companies produce um, the bottled air and the gases that are used uh, for the welding processes and for the refining processes and for the shaping processes or the chemicals that are used to literally produce some of the materials that we're trying to uh, scrap. So the health of these chemical companies is a direct relationship to the health of our industry. We are going to hop right over and look at the first of the two companies. It's called Air Products. And uh, one of the things that I, that I also enjoy about this magazine, magazine, this newsletter, is that um, you can see the amount of information that they give. It's just unbelievable how much information they provide about the companies. But Air Products and chemicals supplies a variety of atmospheric, that's oxygen and nitrogen, and process um, gases, hydrogen, helium, to energy, industrial, technology, and healthcare customers worldwide. So this is important. This is a worldwide company. Um, they have the is they are the world's largest supplier of hydrogen, with leading positions serving uh, refinery, semiconductors, and natural gas injection. So. Um, those of you that are not in the U.S., you can still invest in this company. It still has um, a lot of influence throughout the world because it is a chemical. I mean, it is a worldwide chemical company. All right. So when we look at uh, air products, we can see that they are not qualified by my standard when it comes to their cash flow per share because they went down here, here, here. So that's three downs. Uh, they're allowed to, they're allowed, you know, a, a one down or a flat, right? Um, here they had down, down, down. So they are not qualified uh, by cash flow per share or dividends per share, I mean, earnings per share, but they are qualified in the dividend per share category because they have always increased their dividends per share for the last 17 years. So we call that a div zero. And if we look at that, if we look at that graphically, we can see the yellow line here is the dividends and you can see that's trending up. You can also see that they're 
uh, earnings per share, their cash flow always trending up. I mean, you know, the long term trend is up, but they just have this, you know, they, they get these um, these weird dips that go on in there. And there I go hitting the big button again, man. Uh, and then we have the year to year changes right here. And you can see that the uh, dividend per share change is always on the positive side. All right, now we go to the next company that we're looking at is PPG Industries. PPG, and I'm going to come back to your products in a minute. Hang on. PPG Industries um, is a global manufacturer of a broad range of performance and industrial coatings and architectural coatings and optical and specialty materials. So it's not doing gases. It's not competing directly with air products. Um, it's just doing other kind of chemicals. And uh, we can see that um, <laughs> they actually, their earnings per share and cash flow per share actually look a lot worse than uh, air products did. Uh, but their dividends are still a div zero. So that means uh, that they are uh, still uh, 17 years of increasing dividends per share. Now, let's do something interesting. Let's compare the two side by side. So we saw that with, uh, when we look at PPG, we see that our dividend yield is 1.9%. Not terribly exciting, but that's on $132 a share, right? So, you know, there's some money there, um, but it's still only 1.9%. If we go to air products, we see that their dividend is 2.1%. So it's a little bit better on $311. Uh, so what's interesting though, is when you lay the two side by side, uh, what you can see is if you, if you were going to, you know, want to invest in one of these two companies, you're probably going to say, you know, given the relative cost of the two air products is probably the better investment from a dividend perspective. Now, again, I am interested in dividends that are in the uh, four to five percent range. So I don't get terribly excited about um, either one of these companies because uh, that, uh, you know, those dividends on the order of two percent, they're just not exciting me very much. So um, it's, uh, it, it's a, um, uh, it, it's just one of those things that, uh, you know, they met my criteria, right? There's something that you would consider, but, uh, they're just not offering enough of a dividend to get me really excited. Now, there may be some other reasons why people want to invest in them, but they're certainly not, not there for me. Uh, nothing there really excites me as an investment. All uh, righty. Now, I also want to um, make sure that I am always very upfront with all of you and, and full disclosure about uh, these investment, uh, this investment information. I'm not uh, I'm not a, a uh, licensed financial advisor. Uh, I have no certificates that say that I'm that I, you know, can help people with their money. Um, this is just what I do, what I look at when I'm deciding what I'm going to invest in. Um, I told you already uh, that I own shares of Coca-Cola. That probably doesn't surprise you all, given how much you see me drink Coca-Cola. Um, and I like to think of that as every time I'm drinking a Coca-Cola, I'm helping to pay my own dividends. <laughs> sort of like a self-licking ice cream cone. Um, but I do, uh, we, we talked about some other shares recently that uh, I wanted to give you an update on. Rio Tinto a mining company that we analyzed a few weeks back. I have decided to uh, buy some shares of that. And 3M, another one of the companies that we talked about a few weeks ago, um, I, I'm uh, going to buy some 3M shares too. Now, why is this important? Well, because, you know, you deserve to know that I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Um, so just, you know, I'm trying to be as transparent as I can with you all when I talk about these kind of numbers and, um, and such. Uh, any nickel in a Coke can? Yeah, no. The only way there's going to be a nickel in a Coke can is if I happen to accidentally shove one down there. Uh, so 
Um, <laughs> Simon wants to know uh, if I have any plans on a, on a shark or scrap NFT. Yeah, um, I got to be honest with you, man. I never really got into the NFTs. Um, Non-fungible tokens, you know, I, uh, man, um, I don't know. I mean, I suppose it could be, it could be kind of funny, uh, but yeah, uh, I, I have no plans uh, out there. Not going to happen. Um, uh, Street Copper 11 says he's been buying marijuana stocks. Um, you know, that's an interesting one. Um, I can look at, um, I'm, let me make a note here. And I'll see if I if any of those companies um, uh, are analyzed in um, in the investment survey. Um, if they are, then I will certainly uh, talk about them at some point in the future. Um, so yeah. Um, and uh, Simon said, just a joke. Don't get don't get as serious. <laughs> Oh man! So here, this is a good one. Uh, Street Copper Eleven says all his crypto is in the toilet. You know, um, and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying one way or the other on crypto. Okay, I don't invest in crypto. The reason I don't invest in crypto is because uh, when I was getting my MBA, uh, one of my the professor that taught me this technique for analyzing companies, uh, he was a a, a student of Warren Buffett. And he therefore made all of us students of Warren Buffett. And if you know Warren Buffett, one of his one of the things that he frequently says is that um, you should never invest in something that you do not understand. And that is really important, right? Because otherwise you're just guessing, you're gambling, and uh, investments should not be gambles. So I mean, unless you really understand crypto and what's behind crypto and how crypto works. I would steer clear of it. Um, you know, when I think about things like uh, 3M, I understand 3M. I paid attention to that company for a long time. I finally made the decision to invest in them. I should have done it a long time ago. Uh, Rio Tinto, mining, minerals. Um, I understand and have, have spent some time studying not just the, you know, how minerals are used, but how mining companies have to, you know, the challenges they face. So um, it's really, impor really important. Uh, I, I cannot stress enough how important it is that if you're going to invest in something, make sure you understand what it is. It's got to make sense to you before you invest in it. Otherwise, you're just gambling. Now, hey, there's nothing wrong with, you know, gambling, uh, you know, if you want to. Uh, you could buy money on lottery tickets, or you could throw money at the stock market and see if there's something there for you. Uh, but um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's just one of those things that you got. I, I always tell people don't invest in something you don't understand. Um, Coca-Cola, I understand, right? I get this, you know, this makes sense to me. Um, so, um, and, and, you know, it's like, it's one of those things where, um, it, it, people are always going to want to drink stuff. So, it, you know, it's also just, there's a, there's a longevity to it. So um, I, I, yeah, I stick with that. Um, hey, I, I heard some interesting stuff on um, about YouTube that I wanted to uh, real quickly share with everybody. Um, and um, you're probably, I'm sure a lot of you have heard, you know, the same thing going on here. But just in case, um, you may have noticed that you're probably seeing a lot more shorts uh, on on your YouTube channel when you're looking at, you know, you've got the short shelf. You're probably seeing a lot more shorts popping up. Um, an interesting statistic um, right now or within the last week or so, the numbers are showing around 50 billion shorts views a day. Think about that. 50 billion shorts views every day. Now, uh, the reason why that is also important is because a lot of you that are in the chat right now are also creators. You're making your own videos. 
usually long form content. Some of you I've seen experimenting with shorts uh, like me. You're trying to understand it, trying to figure it out. <clears throat> Excuse me just a minute. And YouTube, uh, starting the 1st of February, has started to monetize shorts. Um, and it's a very complicated formula. Basically, it involves you know, total ad revenue for shorts divided by how many shorts views and your portion of those shorts views. And uh, it makes my head spin. But uh, creators that are putting up shorts that are part of the partner program um, are getting monetized on shorts. 50 billion, that's with a B billion um, <clears throat> shorts views every day. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is for those of you in the chat that are also creators, if you're not looking at shorts for your channel, you might want to think about doing that because there are some opportunities there uh, for you to, you know, add, add into your regular um, schedule uploads. You know, when you're doing your long form uploads, you might only put them up a couple times a week, uh, three times a week, something like that. Uh, but you can put shorts up every day uh, to fill in because they're not going to compete with your long form con content. So it might be something that you want to think about if you haven't already. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk about that some more. You can always reach me at sharkscrapper at gmail.com if you want to talk about that one uh, some more. So, um, Oh, uh, <laughs> no, Simon, that's not the kind of shorts I was talking about. Shorts positions on metal market, a topic for... <laughs> Remember what I talked about understanding uh, a company you were going to invest in? The same goes with how you invest. Um, and I got to tell you, even though I had to study... Uh, the stock market when I was doing my MBA and I had to learn what shorts are and puts and calls and things like that. Yeah, I don't do it. I don't do it. Uh, because if you don't have the time to focus and pay attention to that, um, and I'm talking every hour through the trading day, you've got to be paying attention to that stuff. Yeah, you're very likely going to get taken to the cleaners. Now there are, you know, there are ways to protect your investment when you're when you're buying, uh, you know, for for long when you're going to buy and hold, and you're going to try to protect that, you know, you don't want the price to go way up and then you spend too much or something like that. That's different than puts and calls and stuff. So again, understand how you're going to do it before you do it, because otherwise you could get in a lot of trouble there. Um, I don't think my channel will ever make it far enough to reach monetization. Well, uh, you know, a thousand subscribers, four thousand watch hours, and um, that can happen pretty quick. It all depends on how well you do with your channel, right? Um, so, uh, you know, it's. A, I would never say anything's impossible. You know, my channels, I've gotten monetized. You know, so um, how many? How many folks? So I'm just curious here. How many of you in the chat right now have your own channel? So put yes, and then if you want to put an M or yes, yes, or something like that to say that you are uh, that you are monetized. So you know if you want to go yes, no, the yes I have a channel, but no I'm not monetized, and yes, yes that yes you have a channel and yes you are monetized. I'm just curious because I see a lot of you, I see a lot of your channels, so I know that a lot of you have channels, but I'm. I'm just curious, uh, you know, for sure. Yep, Cruiser Mac. I've been watching Cruiser for a long time. Uh, Salad Cream Boy. Okay, all right. Um, Bush Dog, yes, no. JR Cat, no. You're just, yeah, and that, you know what? That is cool. Uh, JR Cat, you know, there's nothing wrong with just being a consumer of videos and not creating because, man, creating can take up a lot of time. Uh, so, um, it's a, it's definitely, um, definitely something that you gotta, that you gotta commit to if you're going to do it. Um, yes. One video, not monetized. Uh, one comment from Mac. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm glad cruiser Mac commented on it. Simon, I'm going to go check out your channel here. I'm going to write it down right now. 
Simon, the Kelt Scrapper. I'll go check it out uh, and take a look at your channel. Wannabe Scrapper, yes, no. Okay, all right, cool. Um, so, you know, I, I would say keep plugging away at it. DMAC, yes, no. Uh, I would say keep plugging away at it. Uh, you'll get there. Uh, this is a this is an interesting niche within the YouTube genre, uh, the scrapping and recycling niche. Uh, so, um, you know, it takes a little while. You're probably not going to go viral or anything like that in this niche. Uh, but it is a community that supports each other, uh, that uh, spends a lot of time with each other. So I would definitely say keep up. Oops. Uh, keep up uh, posting videos regularly, keep working on your content quality and stuff like that, and you'll get there um, because uh, it is, it's, it's, it's definitely going to come along. Um, yes, obviously my channel isn't doing great. Well, well yeah, uh, you know, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, Everyday Solars, she's had some really tough times. Uh, I don't want to go into a lot of the details, but she has uh, she is an angel on this planet. Um, uh, spent, you know, she had to take care, help do a lot to take care of her sister. Now her sister's children, um, and she is one of uh, one of the blessings that we have on this planet. And the fact that you're even able to put up videos right now, uh, everyday solars is amazing. So you know, girl, you keep you keep doing the best you can. Okay, we're there for you. Um, uh, and let's see, uh, there was another one here that I, that I meant to catch. Darn it. The scroll sometimes gets past me and then it's hard for me to find the comment that I wanted to, that I wanted to uh, pick up one. Um, man, I hate when that happens. Um, but I don't know where that was. All right. Well, anyway. Um, you know what? I'll, I'll probably find it after we get done uh, here. Um, a couple of things to think about here as we get ready to wrap up. Um, if you have your autoplay enabled, then as soon as I shut this down, we are going to go over to Scrapping Irishes Live. Scrapping Irishes Live every Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard. I have the redirect activated, so you don't have to do anything. Uh, it's just going to take us right over there. If you do not have um, autoplay enabled, then you'll probably get a link to ask you if you want to go over there. However you get over there, I encourage you to go on over to Scrapping Irishes Live, and we can continue uh, the discussion over there and uh, have some more fun over on Scrapping Irishes live stream. Don't forget, if there's somebody that you would like me to try to get up here to do another interview with, you can put it in the chat or you can send me an email, sharkscrapper at gmail.com and um, let me know. And if you know the person and you want to make an intro, uh, go ahead and do that too because uh, that, might be, uh, that might be helpful in trying to uh, get somebody up um, uh, you know, for an interview up on the channel. I'm going to be reaching out to some folks too because I had so much fun uh, doing that interview with um, Chris from Board Sort that uh, I really would love to do that again with some folks. Um, the other thing that I think we will just have a little bit of fun with here uh, as we get ready to go is when we had Chris, we were doing a lot of, of board identifications. So we'll take a minute to check out this board and what do you all think now a lot of the de the the identification of this board is going to be very dependent on where you're located uh we 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 just saw a really good video from everyday sellers where she went to the yard and they were classifying the boards for her. They were helping her to identify some things. And there were some things, there's some interesting differences between the way they would grade it and the way we would grade it here in the US and the way board sort identifies things. So um, I thought this would be a fun board to look at because 
when you look at this board, uh, you see down here, it's got these tabs. Oops, let's, let's try this. It's got these tabs. So that would suggest that it came out of something like a piece of telecom. Um, but you can also see that it has gold fingers. So is it a gold finger card? Um, and what if you were to, and this time I do want to make the line really big here. And then I want to do this. And then I want to say, what if you cut the gold fingers off and sold those separately, then what kind of board would you be ending up with? Um, you know, is that a mid-grade board? Is that a peripheral high? Uh, it, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, what would your yard call that? Uh, and what's going to be fun about this is because we're going to be heading over to Scrapping Irish here very soon, and we'll be able to have some fun talking about this while we're all hanging out with Scrapping Irish, uh, scrap, bleh, scrapping Irish uh, as well. So, you know, this is a really interesting board uh, because it could go a few different ways um, depending upon your yard, um, your situation. And then, of course, you know, the other question is, uh, are you a depopulator, right? Do you want to go after... Are you going after all these little chippies, all these little ICs? Are you going after <coughs> tantalums? Uh, you know, there's some there's some cool stuff on this board that if you are a depopulator that you might want to go for, and that changes the whole argument about what kind of board this is and how you would go about uh, selling this board. Here's another one that I'll throw at you. That's why I love this board, because there's so many ways to do this. Another way <coughs> that you could sell this board is um, you could cut this part of the board, and that might even get you telecom high, maybe telecom low. Uh, this would then still be probably mid-grade, and then you would still have the gold fingers that you could sell if you're selling to a refiner. So this is one of those really interesting boards that can go any number of different directions uh, on how you would sell it. And if you were watching us last week with Chris, uh, there, it, there was a, um, um, you know, we, we were, he, he, he commented about, you know, sometimes a board is not very clear. There are some boards that are very clearly, you know, metal socket, a small metal socket or something like that. Uh, but, you know, then there's a little bit, uh, then there are these boards that can be a little bit uh, quite, you know, what is this kind of thing? So I just thought that would be fun to leave you with. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, with, you know, just one of those weird little questions about uh, what kind of board this might be. All right. I'm getting a really weird tickle in my throat, and I don't want to keep coughing on the screen here at y'all. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to put this comment up. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> That's funny. I'm going to go ahead and end the stream. It'll take us right over to Scrapping Irish. Irish uh, might be ready for us. If not, hang out. He'll be right up. <clears throat> I'm going to go take care of this tickle in my throat before I see you all over in Irish. We'll see you all after a while. <laughs>